Welcome to episode three of the O2 Dropcast. My name is Zach Zent, and uh, this is an eternal uh, Arizona Eternal Magic podcast with us today, the co-host, Mr. Daniel Espinoza. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. How you guys doing? Good, doing good, man. And we have Mr. David Sikowski. Excuse me, Sikowski. How you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Now, and we have our special local star here from Arizona. We have Mr. Tony Morada. Hello. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure, dude. Uh, all right. So, oh, man, this is... Uh, this is the episode three, dude. We're actually doing this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. This is cool, man. Uh, last week, we had a little bit of technical difficulties. The audio got a little bit messed up. It took me forever to fix it. Hopefully this week, none of that happens. Hopefully. Yeah. So you guys, I haven't seen you guys in like two weeks at least. I haven't seen Tony for a couple weeks. And in the last couple weeks, a lot has happened. We've done a lot of stuff around here. So if you don't know this, uh, if you're listening outside of Arizona, three people out of the four people in this room went to Japan. I was left out. They didn't <laughs> want me there. <laughs> you had to stay home and hold down the fort, man. Yeah, someone's got to do it. So, um, But yeah, so talk about Japan, man. Well, I think David and Tony have been before. This is my first time. Uh, and like these guys got convinced me to get my passport it was incredible. Um, we were there for about 10 days. David had to dip out early, yeah. but it, it was amazing. We had an unreal amount. Like the food was insane. We had great ramen like every day, sushi. Um, it was mind blowing. I think it's Japan is basically a, the United States, but like 20 years ahead. Really? Yeah. And everyone's nicer. So, <laughs> well, yeah. So there's a right now, dude. I mean, I don't want to get into politics too much, but like all this division with like, the left and right and the politics there, plus all these social justice warriors, plus we have a large amount of a-holes in the United States compared to other people. It's yeah. just a it's just a it's a bad situation in a lot of areas, dude. All these school shootings and stuff, none of that happens in Japan. It was a nice escape, yeah. Like everyone was nice and pleasant and like paradise. It was wonderful. What what about you guys? What do you guys think? Uh, I loved it. It was my third time going back to the country. But wow, really? Yeah, definitely. I love it that much. Um, we're already starting to put plans together for uh, the eternal weekend that's going to be held in Asia in 2019. So hopefully we get some more zones to go out for that. Yeah, is there a date yet announced for it? Not yet. I don't okay. Think so. Oh, All yeah. Right. So I, I got to say, like, when we were at the airport, I was going through David's passport. That thing has like a million stamps. David is, is it the, impressive, world, dude? the world traveler. <laughs> What's like, the number one spot? Ooh, it's got to be Japan. <laughs> is it really? Yeah, definitely. That's the most you've done with your passport. How long have you had your passport? Um, I've had it for three years and I only have one page left. That's blank. Wow. He's dude. literally killing it. That's great, dude. I want to see that. <laughs> that sounds Super impressive. And, and Japan is the most stamps. Uh, actually, I have the most stamps from Germany because I normally fly there and connect there. So whenever I would visit like Amsterdam or Poland or any other country in Europe, I most flights I get to Germany, enter Europe there and then kind of venture from there. But... The most frequented country has got to be Japan. Cool, man. I'm yeah. jealous, dude. I got a bunch of UK on mine, but that's not as cool as Japan, dude. No way. UK is dirty and smoky. Yeah, it's not cool enough, dude. But yeah, so Tony, was this is your third time too or second time to uh, Japan? My second time. And uh, just like the first time, like I was blown away. Just I love going there. The people are just super friendly. They're kind and helpful. Yeah, just... Everything like as the the way they function as a society, it's just I, I like urge everybody if they have any interest in traveling at any point to visit Japan at least once in life. Cool man. Oh yeah, this yeah. was my first trip out of the country, and it was definitely definitely did did it right. Oh, so you popped your travel cherry, it, dude? Yeah. <laughs> like Mexico and Canada don't. Really no, well, count. it's the first time off the continent. That's yeah, a big yeah. deal. Like that international flight, like is it's like an experience, man. Oh, yeah, like the going to the other, yeah, dude, going to the other side of the world. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, crazy it to think about just flying up there in a metal tube. Like it's just that's that's just a weird thought where it's like hundreds of people crammed into a metal tube shooting through the sky to the other side of the planet, at like six hundred miles an hour. At like six hundred miles an hour, like dude, that's it's insane to think about when 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 you really do think about oh, air yeah. travel. It was crazy. Yeah. 
Um, so I know we're going to talk about magic in Japan, but let's talk about what was our favorite thing that we did there, guys. Ooh, that Mario Kart. Oh, we got to ride little go-karts around the city. We got even little cool outfits to one wear, and we'd get to actually ride on the left side of the road. <laughs> that was so insane, fun, dude. Yeah. That sounds like a great time. So you got little outfits. Was So, so it was like Mario Party themed, right? Or Mario character themed? Uh, it was a little all over the place. Okay. I think you were like, what, Chippendales? Yeah, uh, the Chipmunk. Rescue Rangers. Yeah, the Chipmunk. Cool. Cool. Okay. I was Leopard Hello Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, and I was Eevee. So. Oh, Eevee. That's good. That's classic. And then, yeah. And yeah. I think Stefan, who is not here tonight, but I think he'll be in a future episode. He was yeah. a Piccolo from Dragon Ball Z. That's tight, dude. I love Dragon Ball Z, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's but yes. Like, that's if, a good show. If you go to Japan, you have to check out Mario Kart. It was definitely the best thing we did. I think it was like $100 for three hours, and I honestly would pay like $400 to do it again. It, it was so worth it. And then what was the second best thing? So Mario Kart's the first best. What else did you do there? Uh, it, I'd say like seeing how magic tournaments are run in Japan. Oh, yeah? At least that was what my most interesting thing. All right, let's jump into that, man. So there was a big event, and I don't know. I forget the name of it, but it was 306 players, SB. You want to... Yeah, okay, so David's like, David's like, yeah, we got to go to Haruya, and we got to play. Like, he's trying to talk us into going to, like, F&M, like, the yeah. first night we get there. It's like, come on, let's check it out. I wonder, he's like, do they have big F&Ms there? I we didn't get to check. So. So, yeah. so, anyways, David's like, yeah, Sunday there's a tournament at Haruya. It's called the, the Gods of Legacy. And we're like, all right, let's go. We'll, we'll go check it that out. That sounds dope, dude. It the does Gods sound- of Legacy. Yeah. I Dude, too bad we didn't think of that first. Yeah, we could have. Yeah, they're already in like the 12th installment. So they've, they've, they've established yeah, yeah, it. They've yeah. claimed it. But so like, yeah, we'll go play this Legacy tournament. And then we'll go check out the rest of the city. And I think, where did we? We went to go get food or something? Because they didn't open until 9. Yeah, we went and got some Ichiran. Yeah, we got ramen. Delicious. And then we came back like half an hour before they opened up, and there was this huge line, all like outside of the building for the tournament. Um, this this it ended up being a nine round, three hundred and six player legacy tournament. Just on, Holy just on a crap. Sunday. Wow, dude, that's a big tournament, man. Four players from Cap. It was quite yeah, insane. The Cap was three ten, and they almost hit it. Wow. So yeah, like we almost hit the cap of 310. Um, we got registered, uh, filled out our deck list, and we were kind of looking around the room, and there was like tons of DNT, and I, I obviously brought Turbo Depth, so I wasn't excited for that. Yeah. Um, but like there were always like, with it being Japan, there were like w- weird tweaks, right? Everyone's deck was a little different, like there was different tech that they were running. Um, but yeah, anyways, so we, we signed up for the tournament. We assumed Tony was just going to take it down, because you know Tony is like the god of legacy in Arizona, right? Oh yeah, really. Japan to conquer. Um, but somehow I got very lucky. <laughs> yeah. And so I, you did, so you did 10th in the tournament. So congratulations, man. Thank you. That's a, is that one of your best places in a big event like that? Uh, in a, like that's one of the large, like non GP. That's probably the largest non GP tournament I've done, uh, played in. Yeah. And it's definitely one of the best finishes. Um, and it was really like crappy because I was running so hot and I'll, I'll touch, I'll touch on the matchups. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so one, this was my first time playing out of the country. Yeah. David prepped me though. He sent me a YouTube video on how to play in Japan against the player base. Really? The, there's a the, different way to play. Yeah. Like you, you, I mean, there's a language barrier obviously, but you, I mean, a lot of communication is done just with the cards, but the weirdest thing that they do there, and I wouldn't say it's weird, but it's very different. Um, before game one and in between each game, you fan out your sideboard face down to show them that there's 15 cards. Wow. I yeah. Know. That's weird. That is, I mean, that, I, that's not typical for anywhere I've played. I guess it's part of the rules, though. It's and they in the rule book. To a T. Wow, that's intense, dude. So, so that was unique. I mean, but... that's part of the Japanese culture, man. They're pretty meticulous about following rules. They have yeah. a lot of laws, and yeah, that makes sense. So, anyways, that was interesting. And then just like playing a game where I can't really speak with my opponent, yeah. but it's like a lot of gestures and stuff. And so let me ask me. you this: When you get salty, what do you say then? You I mean, you, you can't. Uh, these people are too nice. You can't get salty. <laughs> you can't, like, everyone not, is. You couldn't even get salty at I could not get salty. Wow. They must be really nice right? players. Like, like, I'm like an Imperial Salt Wizard here in Arizona, and now, I, I gotta, could not okay, get salty. Okay. So, Magic players are kind of stinky sometimes, right? Like, we all know it. They're stinky. Kind of. How was the Japanese Magic players' hygiene compared to the Americans? There was a little BO, but there it was, was not little? as bad. For 310 players or whatever, like 306 players in well, like close yeah, quarters, 306 not players bad. playing, not to mention all the spectators, right? Not bad. Yeah, it was not bad. Really? Okay. There so were a th- couple people, though. But, I mean, 
I definitely think they were uh, dressed better than most, like, oh, the yeah. average uh, players in America. Okay. No. I think it's kind of more uh, reflective of, like, Japanese society itself. Like, people in general are dressing up for, like, their everyday jobs at work a lot more there. Yeah, taking more care of their, their selves in general and their appearance. I could see that. There were no butt cracks in the room. Really? I no butt it. cracks. Wow. I well, was, lo- well, I they was don't looking have, They don't them. have a, a, oh, an obesity problem like we do here. Yeah, so, that is true. I mean, we have an obesity problem, therefore we're going to have more butt cracks. I actively sought out butt cracks and I could not find any. Wow. Um, I believe all of what you just yeah, said. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but so anyways, <laughs> yeah, like so I, I did well. Um, and I, as, as you should do before every big tournament, you should change your deck and bring a version that you've never played. <laughs> um, I got a couple reps in at David's house before we went to the airport. That was um, a horrible idea. Right? Do exactly. not take that advice. So I threw you should th- just jam what you have been jamming, what you're most familiar with. Yeah. Well, I've played with Dark Confidant before, and yeah. I've played Turbo Dust for like like the past two. But two the lines years are plus. slightly different. A right? little different. Okay. You have to like evaluate, and you value certain cards differently. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the changes I made is kind of my standard list, but I cut my Elvish Spirit Guides and the Expedition Map for four Dark Confidants to okay. have the additional card draw. Yeah. Uh, and in testing with David, the Miracles matchup is a lot better. Um, so yeah, I brought Dark Confidants with cool. the, it was like medium depths yeah. is what we played. Um, so that's the list I played. So the slow depths is the one that is running the Mox Diamonds, Correct. right? That's the one that I'm actually I just bought some cards for it. I'm gonna get started. I have no idea what I'm doing, but it's been placing well, and I want the deck. It has been crushing. Yeah, and it, the bug one's been doing very well as also. But then there's the black green mm-hmm. with diamonds as well. But I haven't seen any bug place though in any big events. Have you? Uh, th- so I forget. Does it do well online? Tom Hap is a, a proponent proponent of the the bug list, and he does very well online. Okay, and I think he's done well at some some recent tournaments. So it, yeah, but it like does Eternal well. Weekend, and like it's just there's like two copies in top eight of places. Like there was was there there was two in Japan too, wasn't there? I think there were two in the top sixteen. Okay, maybe it was a top sixteen of the GP. Um, and then David Long has been like on a tear with the 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 slow depths deck. Yeah. He's top eighted like three tournaments recently. Okay. Um, but anyway, so like mine's so, like yeah, I got it off track depths. here. Okay. So you got you got the mid depths, you're you're playing something that's not hundred percent familiar, but ninety nine percent familiar. Yeah, pretty, much. pretty close, right? Yeah. And like you figure it out pretty quickly. Yeah. Um so round one, uh I play against an opponent and he's like island uh preordained. So I'm like, oh, all right, sneak attack, maybe, right? Yeah, show and tell. And maybe. so my turn I'm like or maybe miracles with right with the right. priority. Okay, yeah. so th- that's what it ended up being. But I'm like, turn one, pivoting needle, sneak attack, <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, turn two, portent or oh. portent. I'm like, oh, oh no. okay, with um, but and miracles is notoriously not the greatest matchup for Turbo Dubs, but with the addition of Dark Confidant, he's like a must answer. Um, so the deck, the matchup felt much better. Yeah, I because he just, puts a clock on him and card advantage, which they, is hard they, for miracles to deal with. They have to answer him too. Yeah. Like, so uh, I played against Jessica Miracles. I two owed him, um, and I, I did draw very well. Like I think game two, I had like the like a great opening hand of turn one thought sees, and obviously they shuffle away their stuff with the brainstorm and hide it. But then you surgical the brainstorm and you shuffle the top of their library and you leave them with like a crappy hand, a crappy five card hand or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I two owed him. Uh, that's, next, that's or, some that's some next level tech. Oh yeah, yeah. Screwing it with somebody's hand. That yeah, is, turn one thought season. Then yep. they're like, oh, I'm gonna brainstorm and hide my stuff. And then you shuffle it. Yeah. And then you just surgical. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's so their, good. That's um, so good. Yeah, and you leave them with like a really bad hand. Um, and then round two, a uh, little shout out to my boy Dan Ford. I played goblins, smashed it. Yeah. Um, and this was a matchup where like the 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 newness of the confidant kind of hurt me. Because I, I valued that casting him as a blocker over trying to execute my combo quickly. And I lost game one as a result. Yeah. Because he just he just killed the confidants very quickly and yeah. attacked past it. Um, but game two, game three, I was able to get there. Um, match three, uh, another bad matchup. Blue White Stone Blade with Spell Quellers. Ooh. Two owed him. Crushed him. Damn. Yeah, Damn, I was on dude. a tear against the bad matchups. Damn. That's, um, that's great, man. Yeah. And then round four, I played Eldrazi Stompy. I think he took... Yeah, how's he, that matchup? Because they're pretty quick and they have Wasteland. It, yeah, so if they're like, they're fast, right? Their yeah. clock is what's most important, right? Yeah, they're they like three, a, four turns with no interaction typically, right? Yeah, if they can disrupt you with like a Wasteland and get a, a threat or two out quickly, they'll they'll get yeah. you, right? Or and like Mimic, Mimic, Thought Not Seer, take your, your whatever. Over. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
And I think that's what happened. He did disrupt me. The the turn one chalice isn't as backbreaking as like some people think. Because yeah. I mean, even you know, back in the day, like I ran chalices in my sideboard, and yeah. like, it's a sacrifice that you, you make. You can to, naturally draw the combo too. Plus, you have Sylvan Scrying, which is on two instead exactly. of exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's not the worst matchup. I mean, if they have a fast clock and they can disrupt you a little bit, they'll get you. But okay. I did get him two one. So I'm 4-0 at this point, like yeah. feeling great. Yeah, my boy SV, dude, right? 4-0, dude. And then fifth round, I'm at table one. Yeah. So I'm the feature match, right? Ooh, first ooh, time ooh. in Japan, first time playing in Japan at Haruya. Uh, I get feature match against, uh, oh man, what is his name? Yuta Tomahawk. I'm, I'm butchering it so bad. but That's okay. I'm horrible with names, too. He's a gold level pro. Wow. I'm feature match against Is there anything pro. higher than gold level? Is uh, this Hall of Fame? Platinum? Platinum? Is there a platinum thing? Yeah, there's platinum. Yeah, oh, that's okay. when you get like a... Th- I think gold and platinum get you three buys. But so anyway, I sit across the table from this guy, feature match. So this is his second match then because he got... Oh, no, no, because it's not GP or anything. Never mind. No, he, no. he did the work. Yeah, he did the work. Okay. Yeah. So um, he, and he, of course, he's on Miracles. Yeah. Um, and Which is one of your worst matchups. One of the worst matchups. And actually, I got his name. It was uh, Yuta Takahashi. Go level, yeah, Yuta Takahashi, go level pro. Mm-hmm. And so one of like the pivotal moments in game one is I, I thought seized him and I see what he has in his hand. It's like a lot of force of wills and blue cards. And he has like a polluted delta and like an island and an island in play. Okay. And oh, and he had Jace's. Um, so turn two after thought seizes him, I play a pivoting needle with his delta in play. Cool. He lets it resolve. Yes. I, I name the delta. Yeah, you do. And then I have another needle named Jace, right? Same turn? Same turn. So turn one, I thought, sees him, see what he's working with. And then turn two, I needle. He doesn't crack the Delta. I, I immediately name it. Oh, yeah. And then I name Jace. Um, and I'm able to beat him that game because he has no white source in play. And he's got the Delta that's under the needle lock, right? So I know he has no answer. He can't get a sword. Yeah. So crush him can't game one. Can't get out from under right? that. Right? Uh, so that the next level right there, and then game that's two. A, yeah, that's another next level play, dude. The like naming the lands, I think, is really crucial. Like and knowing when to. Yeah, because he he knows that I know that he has Jason hand. Yeah, but I know that I can go off faster if I can cut him off yeah. the opportunity to hit white. It's yep. huge. Um, and then game two, I had another great uh, opening of thought sees surgical, and I'm able to strip him of his you know like all of his brainstorms. And just leave him with a really bad hand. He, he's mana screwed and he's trying to cantrip into more lands. And I I get to a point where he has the white mana. I have the combo. So I have to take it. I have to wait a turn to hit my next land drop so that I can crop, rotate in response mm-hmm. to get Sejiri Steep to protect it. Yeah. So I take the turn off. I pass with combo ready. Okay. Hit my next land drop. Pass to him. In his instep, I make the token. And he has obviously has the swords. All, yeah. The Miracles players they always have the swords. Yeah. Um, and in response, I crop, rotate. Get my go pro white, take it down. So, so you go pro white with the Sajiri step, right? Yeah. Okay. And then cool. the swords, yeah. And that was he had I'm one white sword. I'm so. learning right now. Yeah, we I'm got. I'm totally him. gonna build this deck. So like, if you're playing in the Arizona meta, get ready, dude. Yeah. Th- th- yeah. I'm so, gonna have even more <laughs> decks to surprise people with. Right. Get wrecked. Um. So I take him down 2-0, um, and then so I'm five zero at this point. S- s- round six, miracles again. I played just guy miracles game one. He and takes me. They run Blood Moons in the side, obviously. Uh, I think. It, uh, yeah, I think that might run Blood Moon because they're not yeah. running back to basics in that build. Yeah. Um, I think actually, I think some of the three colors now are running back to basics with three it's just colors better too. Than Blood Moon. <laughs> you think so? I think it is because you can use your land once. Okay. Uh, so anyway, he takes me down game one really quick with the mentor, and then game two, uh, I'm able to get him. And I know there was something epic that happened in game three, but it was a clincher. We almost went to time. And I get game three, right? So I'm 6 0. This next <laughs> that's, round. That, that's so good. If I win it, I can double draw in the top eight after yeah, this. Absolutely. So I'm feeling good. I played four bad matchups. I crushed them. I sit across from my opponent. Round seven. Round seven. I just got to win this and I'm good. Um, I thought seize him or duress him and I see ensnaring bridge, ensnaring bridge. And oh geez <laughs> yeah like the, the 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 sadness just washes over me it's so okay do you remember stompy. okay so in that situation when they have multiple ensnaring bridges like like because you you can't get around that very easily right especially if they like lock you off with a blood moon you can't get to your colors to destroy it so in that situation what did you take do you remember uh um, that's a really bad matchup i think i took one of his creatures 
Oh, gotcha. To slow him down, right? To slow him down. Because did, did he not have the moon or something? He didn't have a moon. Okay. Um, and the, yeah, so the thing with that, those decks are, it's not the first blood moon or the first bridge that matters. It's just like the the redundancy, right? Yeah. Like you can deal with one. You can deal with two maybe. But you, yeah, but then there's two and then there's three and then there's blood moon and Magus of the moon and there's oh, bridge. Yeah. They have so many like threats. It's just like, yeah, they have probably like 12 cards. It's too Easy. much. Yeah. yeah. So game one, he gets me, and I, I play one of the risky builds that does not have main board abrupt decays or anything like that. Okay. So I literally cannot deal with the resolved and staring bridge. You're just to, you're turboing, yeah. I'm trying to turbo. Yeah, you're still. trying to turbo. You're not in the full slow depths. Correct. Yeah. Um. So game two, I bring in assassin's trophy and three abrupt decays, and I I think that was it. Um. I really wish I had right of consumption in this matchup. So you've been playing turbo depths for a, a long time now, and an abrupt decay was the go to, right? And sometimes even crows and grip. Crows and grip. But sometimes. now that now that Assassin's Trophy is played, how does that play into like how you play the deck and the split there? Does it make any real big difference on how the deck plays having the one of the Assassin's Trophy? So I am doing the one of okay. because it's so I was running three to four abrupt decays at any given time. Yeah. Um and I like how you can hit additional threats. So it's still bad in the miracles matchup where you're trying to hit counterbalance and back to basics because you need it, you need abrupt decay because it's gonna resolve regardless, right? Yeah. So the blue matchups, you don't bring in the Assassin's Trophy, but like stuff like Death and Taxes, where you can hit a Caracas or yeah. Schadenport, you ring an Assassin's Trophy. And against like a matchup like Mono Red Stompy, where they can't counter your stuff, yeah. you ring an Assassin's Trophy because okay. cool, I'll, I'll, t- I'll kill your Blood Moon okay. or your Bridge. But since and blue is the majority of the meta, you run the Abrupt Decays instead. The right? uncountable clause is so important okay. though, right yeah so yeah the one assassin's trophy is great because i mean it can yeah. hit just like a, a gurmag angler so the, the three one split is is based off of maybe blue matches versus non-blue matches correct um okay. because abrupt decay is still better in other matchups where you would not yeah, like miracle trophy. stone blade stuff that's going to screw you over with with the counter spells plus the swords and snap sword stuff exactly yeah um so game two i bring in the 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 uh abrupt decays and all that stuff um and the you know and this game's kind of it goes so long right and this is a win and in so a lot of people are watching us mm-hmm. he has obviously he has two bridges out yeah. i've got this giant floating avatar just sitting there in the sky doing nothing yep i've got two dark confidants in play <laughs> they just can't drawing, swing. i'm like drawing three cards a turn trying to find a way to blow them up um did you I, kill yourself with the dark confidants no like okay. not never not even close man i would always hit land so what was his win con then um he ended up Getting me with a uh, Legion War Boss. Okay, so he, he was like sw- drawing a card, swinging in under you. So what? Uh, he used he ended up using Fiery Confluence to kill off my guys. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, then there was no blockers. Yes, and then I just had Merit Legion. He had a bunch of little guys, and he would. Mentor and they were them. Sw- yeah, and they're swinging under. Yeah, and the yeah. Fiery Confluence does, does some damage to me. Oh yeah, on the modes. But um, so I found one Assassin's Trophy, so I was able to blow up one of his bridges. And then I think two or three turns went by with me drawing three cards a turn. I could not find the other one before he was able to fiery confluence and then kill me. Yeah. So, yeah. We well, can't win them all. So the hot right. streak ended there. And then how did round eight go? Round eight, I played one of the best matchups ever. Yeah. Burn. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I 2-0 this guy. So Yeah, you were faster than him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my hopes are back back there. Like, and he was playing Burn with like Beaumont Courier, which was interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's, I'm yeah, seven that's, one. That's going in some decks nowadays. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's a decent card because it refills your hand after you, you know, cast everything. Yeah. So I'm seven one going into the last round. I'm in sixth place. Mm-hmm. I cannot draw, and I have to. I have to win, right? So I sit across from my opponent, and I think I even win the die roll. And I turn one. Oh yeah, like my hand is like swamp, swamp by you, Lotus Petal, Thought Seize, Duress, and some other stuff. I'm like this is great. I'll keep it. And I like, Thought Seize them, and I see. Blood Moon and Magus of the Moon. You're just done. I'm like, oh my god! But I, so I'm able to use the Swamp and the Lotus Petal and the mm-hmm. Thought Seeds and the rest to strip his Magus and his Blood Moon. Yeah. But of course he he, he just hits, hits more. He hits it really quick. Yeah. So he there's just tons more in that deck. He quickly O twos me, which was pretty anticlimactic of a day, right? Like I did well. I played so many bad matchups, crushed them, and then at the two most pivotal matches, my both winning ends, I play Mono Red Stompy. And literally get stomped. Some bad luck, dude. That so mono red stompy. I mean, I don't know the Japanese meta, but like having two that high up, like, like there were three in the top eight, bro. Yeah, that's that's crazy, dude. Yeah, I was looking it up, and Turbo Depths took it down, though. Turbo Depths, the Tur- slow depths, Tur- yes, yeah, slow depths the took slow it down. depths is more resilient to that kind of stuff. Well, the um, main board abrupt decays are huge. Yeah, so we may have to try that build, build but like I have not seen uh, mono red stompy in the meta in such a while, uh, a long time, and it hasn't done. 
particularly well in on Moto, so I, it was not even on my radar. Did you see Steely result Steely yes. resolve in the side? What I do you think that. about that? I, it's all right, but I think safekeeper safekeeper is just insane, especially when you're okay. running Dark Confidant and you want to use the safekeeper to protect Dark Confidant as yeah. well. But I have tried Steely Resolve in the past. Yeah, the top the top list is actually running hymns. Is that typical now? I was running two hymns. Okay, all right. Sideboard, cool. right? He had him in the side. No, he has three main. main board, dude. Wow. Yeah, so his main board weird stuff is he's running two life from Malone, which I think yep. is odd. Uh, three him to Torox, uh, and then he's running two Sylvan Libraries. Is it normally one or is it normally two? Usually, there's one in the main and like one in the side. So he's going real slow in the main. Yeah. Yeah, it's more. It's almost like a mid range deck. It's like a mid range combo deck almost. It's it's turning into something not turbo y at all. Yeah, it is crazy. Like yeah. when the deck took down Eternal Weekend two years ago, I think it was 2016 Eternal Weekend European. It was all. It was like a fast. It was a fast glass combo, cannon, right? Yeah, it was a glass it was, cannon. It was turbo to the max. If you missed it, you missed it, and it, you were screwed for the rest of the game. This seems to have these lists now seem to have more longevity, and they yeah. can handle the metal a lot and, better. And it's interesting to see the the different builds that are branching off. Yeah. You have turbo still, you have like mid, you have slow, you see the bug depth. So it's really cool to see like the archetype develop. So what did, so then that was the last round for you, right? So last round. That was, that was oh, sad. I'll tell you about my prizing real quick. Yeah. What was your prizing? Okay. At? So you, yeah. this was essentially a 5k tournament, right? Cause it was okay. like 2000 yen to enter. There's like 300 people. We figured it out. It was 2000 like, yen is what? 20 bucks? A little under 20 bucks. So it okay. was about $5,500 in pricing, right? Wow. That's awesome, I made, dude. Bro, I made top 16. I got 10th place. Yeah. My pricing? Yeah. Six guilds of Ravnica packs. Oh, no, <laughs> dude. That's so sad. So it was really top heavy pricing. It was really man. top heavy. They got like yeah. tons of Haria credit. Yeah. And I got six packs. I wonder what first got, dude. Like if we were going to be splitting 30,000 Haria points. I don't know what that translates to. Value that sounds wise. like a lot, though. Sounds like a lot. Yeah. Eight. How many points did you get for your Ravnica packs? I just got the packs, dude. I didn't even get points. Oh, they didn't even give you any like credit or choice? Like, here's six packs. I thought you got like so little credit. The only thing you could buy was... Oh. Ninth through 16th got packs. Did you pull anything good? I think like an experimental frenzy, but like it was not worth yeah, it. That's, that's not <laughs> Grinding good. nine rounds for six packs. Yeah. Um, but first place also got the title of the God of Legacy. Yeah. So. And then of course, uh, Mr. Sikowski staying true to his nature, staying true to Arizona, staying true to the podcast, O2 dropped. Definitely. Um, <laughs> no, he bro. He went hard. He went oh, oh he four. Went, oh four, dude. Next, yeah. that's two o oh, two drops, man. Oh, yeah. That's impressive. Uh, round one, Black Red Reanimator. He yeah. had he just had it each each game. Um, he brought out this cool Eldrazi. I actually had to ask a judge what does it mean. Um, <laughs> Sweet. Apparently, you can't cast even spells. What even Void converted Widower. mana cost? What is it called? Void Widower. Void Widower. Winnower. Winnower. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Tony's shaking his head, and he knows what this does. What does it do exactly? Uh, the opponent can't cast uh, even-costed spells. Okay. All and right. it's like a 7-Eleven creature, right? It's huge. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> wow, what is the, what's the CMC on it? Nine, I think. Nine? Yeah, it that's a big boy. actually was one. He cast Reanimate. Yeah, he oh, made a Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course, yeah, of course, it was one. <laughs> yeah, wow. so he cleaned up that game really quick. That's uh, so good against Storm. Uh, next, uh, black, red, uh, I mean, blue, red, uh, Delver burn. Um, he just had it really quick. He locked down, uh, the past and flames line with a turn one Tormod script and then just Wait, kept main burn. board Tormod script. Or uh, was this a side game? Uh, it was already game two. Oh, I okay. actually think I got one game on him. Game okay. one. All right. But then game two and three, he locked down the past and flames line really quick and then just burned me making sure that nauseam could never pay off for a lot of cards. Yeah. So did he have the Delver flip and all the, yeah, you know, all the yeah, just all firing in all cylinders. Okay. Yeah. Uh, monastery Swiss beer was in there as well. He did good work. It's blue red burn. Yeah. And then, um, I lost against a black, white, green deck with like Thalia, him, Mox Diamond, and it just... So Maverick, Abzan? I, I, don't, I don't know. So Thalia, Mox Diamonds, that sounds like... like Green Sun Zeniths and stuff? I didn't see any Green Suns. Did you see any Punishing Fire? Was it like there some was no weird red. aggro loam list? There was no red in there. Okay. was Did you see like Noble Hierarchs and like Stoneforge? Mm-hmm. We did not get that far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure he probably would have cast those. Those are main board threats for Maverick. So it doesn't sound like it was exactly Maverick. It was, it was, 
We were in Japan. It yeah, probably dude. was a really cool brew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. and then uh, for the last round, uh, I actually got the buy, but one way or another, I knew I had to head so to the sad. airport. Yeah. So I kind of just took the buy, went outside, had a drink, and and you played Storm. You played Ant. Yes. Just yes, so the, yeah. So David Sikowski here. Excuse me, Sikowski. Uh, he is he's one of the Storm players in Arizona. We got a lot of them. It's like a it's an infection. We're trying to get rid it's of really it. Really bad. Yeah. But there, and no matter how many you know antibiotics we take, it's just they're just. You know, storms are brewing, just storming off on the community, man. Um, and then, so Tony, how did you end up? Were you, you were at the same event, right? Yeah, okay. I uh, ended up going five four. I uh, did what uh, SB Sage advice and tried a new deck that I hadn't actually like played <laughs> before. Okay, uh, a different build in my typical twelve post build. Yeah, so we were talking about it earlier. Was it similar to the list that I told you? I think thought was worse against combo. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right, so I know a little bit about that list, but for people who don't, uh, why don't you tell them about what what you're actually playing and in, in your version of the 12 post? Uh, so yeah, actually, I've been like, for the most part, I've been playing with a uh, bug build of 12 posts. Okay. Blue, black, and green. Okay. I mean, I've always stuck with blue and green, and the black is pretty much specifically only for a Brep Decay. Okay. But uh, for this particular tournament, for whatever reason, I kind of wanted to just go back to blue and green only. Okay. Which uh, turned out to be a mistake, as I quickly realized from this God of Legacy tournament. But uh, I just so why is it a why is that uh, a mistake? Is it because it's worse against combo and there was a lot of that? No, more so. I think I just missed the uh, abrupt decays more than anything. The removal for fair. Yeah. That was the big thing then. The uh, removal. It used to be fine to just have blue and green only, and usually you were fine uh, with something like engineered explosives or yeah. repeals. But yeah, I guess get rid of is, ones and twos. Exactly. Yeah. But I think the meta's changed enough to where that's just not good enough anymore. Okay. So yeah, I definitely missed the uh, black, the abrupt decays. Yeah, because it's just kind of a catch-all in legacy. Like like three CMC is typically the top of most decks. And what's that three CMC Unless card that you saw a lot? Uh, back to basics. Ooh, 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 the white ooh, one. Ooh. Uh, Monastery Mentor. Yeah, that guy's seen a lot more play in Miracles. <laughs> yeah. In Japan, it sees more play over there. I think in general, um, in it's general, just like a really it? fast clock. Like yeah. Tony's deck, we're trying to build up, like a, a quick mentor and some cantrips, like really can get out. Oh, of Oh yeah! Game. Plus they have the counterspell backups too. Mm-hmm. You know. All right. So round one, do you remember what you played? How many rounds did you play? Uh, I played the full nine rounds. Okay. Uh, round one was against Turbo Depths, and I won that. It was a close matchup, like it usually is. Basically, you need to tiptoe and make sure you just don't die out of nowhere. And if you prolong the game long enough, you can win, usually. Uh, round two, I lost to Death and Taxes, which is another matchup that I should definitely win, I feel like. But they do sometimes get you. Yeah. Well, because they can lock you down. Lock down your mana, plus you usually have some type of clock and the Aether Vial and the Flicker for your big dudes, if need be. Yeah, they have quite a few answers that can mess with you. Exactly. Okay. And so what round was that? Uh, that was the second round. That was second round DNT, and that was another loss? Yeah, so okay. that was 1-1 one, one at that point. Oh, okay, so, okay you're 1-1 one, one at that point. All right. Uh, the next three rounds, I remember, were all Grixis Delver opponents. Cool. And I won the first two, but then lost the third one. Okay. So I was 3-2 at that point. And that's a positive matchup for 12 post. Sounds about 66%. Yeah, 66. <laughs> yeah, 66%. Yeah, 66%. Yeah, so it's generally a positive matchup. That's why you play the deck, right? Yeah, it's definitely... Because it burns on the... It, it gets good against the fair decks, typically. Yeah, that's the matchups you definitely want to be facing of the possible things in Legacy, playing 12 posts. Uh, and then, I hate to admit it, but the sixth round then, I lost to Miracles, which is supposedly, like, the deck, 12 post deck's best matchup. Yeah. But this was the exact case where I really missed the abrupt decay, where I think uh, having engineered explosives as removal was definitely not enough. Yeah, just a little bit too slow because you can't hit the mentors and you can't hit... uh, Back to basics. Back to basics. Well, yeah, you can't hit the tokens. Sorry, yeah, you can't hit the tokens and the mentor at the same time. Yeah, for sure. Those two cards are like the cards that will beat you. And then that's where I really missed like just the uncounterable guaranteed of uh, abrupt decay. Yeah, it's just it's nice to see abrupt decay in your hand. You know, it's just it's just a solid card. Okay, and so then, uh, what were some of the other uh, matchups? Did you have any memorable matchups? You're starting at round six now, right? So miracles was round five, and you're two two three at this point. Uh, I think that was the third loss. So that was three three at that point. Okay, six rounds. I'm sorry, I'm lost. No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, so I was pretty much out of the contention for top eight at that point, but I was still pointed out just because I was there. I wanted to see some interesting Japanese brews. Uh, round seven, I believe, was he was playing like a Grixis kind of burn deck where he had like Soul Scar Mage and uh, Monastery Swift Spear. More okay. of like a burn deck than like a Delver deck, but. Okay, did you see any like. Does he have days and stuff still? Yeah. Okay, yeah, for, yeah, that makes sense. Did you see any risk factors? No, I didn't. Oh, man. Yeah, I saw that in the side of uh, a lot of the the blue red burn uh, Delver it's, decks. It's starting to become a thing in Legacy. Yeah, because you can reload your hand, or you can you deal can damage. damage, and, and yeah. you can jumpstart it back. And you can jumpstart it back. Yeah, it's got a lot of value in those decks. Like late game, a lot of value against miracles or something. Hell yeah! Where you've already done twelve points of damage or, or something close to that. How'd you do in that one? Uh, I won that one, and I wouldn't be surprised if he did have something like risk factor because it seemed like quite the interesting brew. What like, was the black for? Uh, I believe there was a Gurmog Angler for extra okay. damage. All right. All right. Okay. I don't remember exactly, though. Did you see any, like, Death Shadow? No, I didn't see Death Shadow. That might not be Bump horrible in the there. night, bro. You <laughs> know? All right. Uh, so I won that round. Then round eight, I lost to Omnitel, which is a terrible matchup for 12 posts. Yeah, it is. Though I was able to pull Steel one game, and then games two and three, he he was splashing white, so I thought it was pretty interesting. He brought in the Monastery Mentor, which, yeah. of course, is another card that I can't beat currently. Yeah. But I thought it was a good idea for that kind of deck, not relying just on like only show and tell into Omni. Okay. So I lost that, and then the last round was against Jeskai Stoneblade, which I beat that pretty easily. Cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that again, it seems like you're preying on the, you know, the fair matchups. Just like twelve post typically, we just wants to go bigger and play better stuff at the same speed that you're playing normal legacy threats, right? Yeah, you want to be facing against uh, normal creatures and trying yeah, to... Yeah, small creatures back. that don't have big Eldrazi abilities. So, right. so uh, for people who don't know, I, we'll, put up the, we'll put up the deck list here for uh, all three of the players that we had in Japan at that event. Just showcase our, our Arizona Legacy players. So you can check that out. Uh, it's going to be on the website, azeternalmagic.com. And we'll put up a page there. Uh, should, maybe we'll even uh, you know put it on the homepage with the podcast to showcase our players. So... And we had some other players there too. We also had uh, another another guy, Stefan, from the community. And was uh, Mike playing in that event? Oh, Mike wasn't there yet. Mike wasn't there yet. Okay, but we still had four Arizona Legacy players overseas in Japan, Hell which yeah. is pretty cool. All right, so we're gonna take a little bit of a break, and uh, after that, we're gonna answer some questions from the community. And uh, if you have questions, you can always email them to Arizona Eternal Magic at gmail dot com. Uh, and that's where you can submit all your questions, and we'll try to read them on the show as many as possible. Uh, enjoy this music, and we'll be back in a sec. All right, and welcome back. So we're going to answer some questions from the community here. There, a lot of them are directed uh, towards Tony Murata, so we had some good response on the questions here in Arizona. So, you know, shout out to our community uh, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome, man. I can't say I can't say enough about our community. It's just growing bigger and bigger. Um, so, but first, let's introduce Tony Murata. Everyone in Arizona knows him. I don't know if everyone also knows all of his accomplishments. And people outside of Arizona, he might not know his accomplishments either. But uh, Tony actually top. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. He won the SCG Open San Diego in 2013, playing twelve post. Twelve post. Then he had two top eight SCG events. One was in Vegas in 2011 playing Reanimator. Yes, correct. And was that the blue-black version? Yeah. Okay. Black-red hadn't been discovered at that point. Okay, yeah. All right, so the black-red hadn't been... So that was blue-black. And then Worcester in 17, you top eighted that one as well. Now, here in Arizona, we also have what we call the uh, Arizona Eternal Magic Legacy Series, where we have events throughout the year where you accumulate points, and then you get an invite... The top 16 players get an invite to what we call the Masters. And Tony actually has made every single Masters and done well in most of them, uh, if not all of them. He's probably been in the top half, right? Yeah. And then he won the very first Masters series in Arizona. 
And then was it this year or last year you won the the 5K at Eternal Weekend? Was that 2017? Yeah, that was last year. That was 27. So you had two. You had a top eight, made it to the Masters, and won a 5K in 2017. So that was a pretty good year for you. Yeah. Right on, man. And that was all with 12 posts and different variants on that that you've been yeah. that you've been messing with. So let's talk about your deck choice, man. So you obviously do really well with it. You played the blue black reanimator. Got top eight back in 2011, and then you switched over to 12 post. Correct. So tell me a little bit about that. Why did you Why did you choose that deck, and where's its strengths and weaknesses, and where do you, where do you see it going? Uh, well, I first saw the deck. Uh, it got like second place at another SCG Open on the East Coast, like late 2012, uh, played by Jeremiah Rudolph, who's like pretty much considered like the founder of that build. And the thing that drew me to the deck because I had heard about. Uh, using, like, Cloud Post plus Glimmer Post plus Vesuva before. But, like everybody else, I was convinced that Wasteland would just wreck that kind of strategy. But he had main deck Pithy Needle, which I thought was just, like, a pretty genius, like, solution for that. Yeah. So I just decided to give it a shot, tried it at a few, like, local tournaments, and pretty much just loved it at that point. Pretty much had, like, everything that I wanted in a Magic deck. So I just uh, read up what I could about the deck... Uh, what little resources there were online and then just tested it out and just pretty much loved it and went from there. Cool, man. Yeah. So what do you, what do you love about the deck and what, what's your favorite parts about playing it? What's your least favorite parts? Cause there's gotta be some drawbacks, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, I like the inevitability about it. Pretty much just the, you want the game to go as long as possible. And then just, if you can keep the game going out as long as you can, it's pretty much like your win condition is insurmountable. Like there's pretty much nothing they can do about it once you get to your like ultimate win condition. Yeah, I was on the other end of that for uh, <laughs> we have a league here, and like it was like Emmer cool, and I was like, okay, I have an edict. And then now he was like Kozilek, and I was like, okay, I can snap edict that. And then like the very next turn, what was it? What did you finish me off with? Was it another Kozilek or something? Was it I was think- it three Kozileks or two Kozileks? Yeah, it might have been, or like a second Ember Cool. I don't remember. Or Ulamog, I think, or something like that. Yeah, so it was, yeah, that deck, the longer it goes, the bigger stuff that it plays. And then yeah. just like the broken loop of hard casting Ember Cool so easily, and then using Caracas to balance him and just take all the turns. Yeah, so you run the, the crop rotations, and then you can get the Caracas out, take infinite turns. Like, so it is, it is a really late game combo deck, as well as just running big threats that take over the board. Yeah, and I think the biggest draw of the deck, at least to me, is that. Just the simple fact that it derives so much of its powers from just its lands. Like, lands are just, like, the most fundamental part of playing Magic. But, like, in this deck, they're basically, like, your win condition. Like, you can basically win off of having, like, pretty much only five or six lands in play. Yeah. Which, when you think about it, it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. So, as long as you're making your land drops and you either find a big threat or you find an Eye of Ugin, right? Exactly. Or, or you have minimal land drops and you run the show and tell build in there too. So you can cast show and tell into one of those big guys early game too. And, uh, you know, maybe even draw out some counter magic for another big guy the next turn or something, right? Yeah, that's why I've always loved having blue in there, specifically for show and tell, because that just feels like cheating in so many matchups. Yeah. Like it's stolen me so many games that I would have otherwise lost. Just And, and oh, you run that in the main. Yeah, always like four main usually when I'm running it. Well, like the engine to ramp to your Eldrazi is show until prime time, and they use the primeval titan to just like get all of his lands out. Yeah. Well, I want to, and the next thing I want to talk about here, because I've never, uh, I've never done this before. You, you won an SCG event with this deck, which is a fringe deck, which yeah. is maybe some people would even call a shitty deck. <laughs> like <laughs> it's true. It's a, it's some in a lot of respects. Just being blatant here, it is. It is like a tier three deck. Let's let's okay. talk about it, right? Like, so it's it's not even. I mean, maybe tier two best. Would you guys I would say? say it's a tier two? Tier He's, two point five. I don't know. What do you think, Tony? Yeah. What do you think, Tony? <laughs> I mean, people say a lot of things. I would ask them like, what exactly makes it like a poor deck to you? Yeah. And I think. Tur- I mean, tournament results. Yeah. But also, a lot of people don't play it. So That's true. So maybe. I mean. Honestly, without any information, if I just saw the list without seeing you play it, I would be like, "What? Well, this is a pile." You know what I mean? It's it, there's uh, there's synergy to it, but it just seems like it has so many like blaring weaknesses, right? Um, but so why? So when you won the SCG event with this deck, how good did that feel to play a fringe deck 
and then take down the entire tournament. Oh, it was the best, man. Like, I don't think I'd like, I'd rather do it with a fringe deck than like doing it with like the most commonly played deck at the time. Yeah. Now, that's the great thing about Legacy, dude. Like, you can play a non meta deck and get there. Yeah. So, I, I think the, I think in all, the, the hands of myself, you, Zach, and David, it's a tier three deck. But with Tony, it's yeah. In the driver's seat, it's a it's a tier one. It's deck. like it's S tier, dude. It's up there. Yeah. It's above tier one, man. Like Tony, yeah. I've lost way too many times to this guy. Uh, more, more. Yeah, it's causing me shame now. Like yeah. I'm just I'm just <laughs> losing this matchup a lot. But so so it felt really good. And do you remember the finals? Do you remember what you played in the finals back then? Uh, yeah, the finals was Rug Delver. And at the time, I remember that blue green build was pretty well like situated against Rug Delver. Yeah, I had like four repeals, which at the time, uh, Insectile Aberration had a converted mana cost of zero, so repeal would basically unsummon it for free, cantrip, and then like basically set them back so much tempo. Yeah, so you get even more time to cast your big stuff. It's like yeah. a double time walk. Yeah. You got to recast it and then flip it. Yeah. Wow. wow. All right, and then so let's talk about your most uh, your most recent win, where you took down the the Eternal Weekend, the five K at Eternal Weekend. How, how did that must have felt great too, man? I can't imagine taking down a five K because that's what 100, 200 players or something. Because it's like a thirty five dollar entry. It was a fifty dollar. Yeah, was it fifty? This oh. particular tournament was. Uh, <laughs> this was after the main. That's event. a big boys tournament right there. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think they only had like 50 people at this tournament. Oh, this wow. This was on like the Sunday of last year's Eternal Weekend. <laughs> okay. And so, yeah, I remember me, Espy, and Dan Ford like played in it. We all did pretty well. But yeah, it was like a $50 entry tournament. That means they had to pay out 2500 bucks. Uh, they lost money on that. Yeah, they <laughs> lost money on that one for sure. Yeah, poor Eternal Weekend, dude. They didn't uh, have it again this year. Oh, I'm, I'm su- yeah, no? I'm guessing. Yeah, that's 5K. Probably did they not work three out round, too well. Three round <laughs> prize vault tournament. Yeah. <laughs> so what? So in your finals there, what did you play, and and how did that feel? Uh, so that finals, it was actually against uh, a guy I had known. He had known about me. His name was Dan Neely, and he had played 12 posts and placed kind of well with it at some opens before that. And uh, he had wanted to drive back to Ohio that night. Okay. So we just decided to split, actually, at that point. He decided to give me, like, the tournament win, but we just split the prize. And the prize was still, like, $1,300 in credit for each of us. Yeah. So I picked up my Mox Emerald there. Yeah, you're, yeah you, got, you got a lot of nice cards now, man. Like, you have all of your gurus. You have, is it Alpha or Beta Trops? Uh, beta Trops. Beta Trops, dude. Everything is foiled out with original printings. It's a beautiful deck you got. So you must really love the deck. What, are, what, do, you, what do you not like about the deck? Like, what, where, is, where does it suffer and, and have weaknesses? Oh, so it has plenty of weaknesses. Uh, the main uh, enemy of the deck is anything that can win quickly that the deck just can't interact well with. Which is typically most combo decks that use only spells and not creatures i'd say like storm and omnitel are the worst kind of matchups gotcha certainly sneak and show as well because it's just not really winning through its creatures it's just cheating them out and like omnisciousing them yeah so it's it's kind of doing the same thing you are but quicker yeah yeah you have like no at least main deck you have no real interaction to stop them and then even sideboarding even if you include like a whole suite of counter spells and force of wills I mean, that's kind of those combo decks are designed to fight through main deck like those cards anyway. Yeah, well, especially since um, you know the sneak and show and the omni, they're running their own suite of counter spells too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, those like decks are like difficult, but as well also just anything that really punishes mana bases, either through like recurring wastelands or. A lot of Blood Moons are back to basics. Those can also be devastating for the deck strategy. So would like Loam or Lands be a, a poor matchup then? I definitely like the Loam decks. Lands has a little bit of like difficulties itself handling a show and tell or like even a Pithing Needle, especially game one. Yeah. So you have some trump cards against them, but they're definitely a deck that can get you if you don't have the right answers. Okay. Now I know the only time I think I've won against you is with a Blood Moon. 
<laughs> so oh, yeah, that was like a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah, it was a couple weeks ago. We were playing our league match, and uh, I I uh, lost game one with Grixis control, and then I blood mooned you games two and three on the curve. I could, and I got super fun. lucky. You know, like I just I just felt like the luckiest guy in the world. So is so is blood moon hard for that deck to deal with? Cast on turn three. Uh, definitely. What are your kind of your answers to that, or back to basics stuff like that? Uh, sideboard, I always run Crow Sun Grips these days. Okay. But uh, if I'm running the Bug Build, which I should have been running this past weekend or so. Thanks, SB. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, I, I, I lo- that's why I love having the Abrupt Decays there. Usually yeah. there's just one specific permanent, such as a Blood Moon or a Back to Basics, even Chalice of the Void, because my deck relies on one drops. Yeah, with Brainstorms and Crops. Yeah, so just having a answer for one of those things is like it's like everything in those matchups okay so the definitely the bug version just handles handles those kind of hate pieces a little bit better yeah that's where i, I choose okay. it all right perfect man well i think we're going to go to some questions now for you tony from the community so uh, most people again know uh know tony here and let's uh let's actually just start off with david you got a question for tony right yeah i was kind of wondering um what is a better card against you? Would you rather see a Blood Moon against you, or would you rather see a Back to Basics cast against you? Uh, traditionally... Ooh, that's a tough question. <laughs> it was always Back to Basics used to be way worse for me when my only answer was Cross and Grip, because usually you would plan for a Blood Moon and then just have like your basic forest ready but then sometimes you couldn't find like enough untapped lands to actually hit the back to basics but ever since i adopted abrupt decay i'd much rather see uh back to basics honestly okay, okay. so you're not on the version that's running candelabra anymore right uh not typically no i okay. mean no not with the bug build because that's, but that's easier for back to basics right yeah definitely okay all right next question we have here so this is from a uh, little Tommy Kaufman here wants to know, why do you play Kozilek, Butcher of Truth? Uh, so I get a lot of flack for choosing that particular creature, especially in comparison to some of the other options. But I definitely have my reasons for liking him. Well, usually if you're going to... So the usually the uh, big targets you always include are Emrakul the Eon Store, and that's your big finisher. Ulamog the Caesar's Hunger. Okay. Kind of like your Swiss Army knife for like a lot of late game situations. Because that's the one that exiles two permanents when he comes in, right? Yeah. Okay. He's just amazing for so many different things. But then uh, whether you even run another creature at all is a question. And then which of the other ones? Usually it's either Old Kozilek, New Kozilek, or New Emrakul. And the thing I like most about Old Kozilek is he's the most consistent and he gives you like the most like definite thing every time. So for people who don't know, how does uh, Kozilek Book of Truth, how does he read? Uh, when you cast him, you draw four cards. He has Annihilator 4 when he attacks. And then he also has, uh, when he hits the graveyard from anywhere, you shuffle your graveyard into your library. Okay. That's not always ir- uh, irrelevant, but... Uh, yeah, because you're trying to push the games out as long as possible, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it having you know cards shuffled back into your deck keeps you in there longer. And you yeah. can get him back with Eye of Ugin. Yeah, that's true, and you can fish him back out, too. And same thing with like the crop rotations if something gets wastelanded, and you know maybe you need yeah, you know, definitely, to like, shuffle that. Sometimes you want to get your Eye of Ugin back into your deck, or like your Ulamog is already in your graveyard. Then that yeah. Kozilek trigger definitely helps you, uh, especially in the longer grindy matchups. Yeah. But uh, with Butcher of Truth, the Annihilator definitely uh, is underrated by a lot of people. I think it makes him like a threat once he's on the board, which is something that all your creatures in that deck have if you're running Butcher of Truth as one of them. Compared to, and I like to compare it to the other options because I've played the other ones too. Uh, Emrakul, the Promised End, which is sometimes like <laughs> you could do some really nasty things taking control of their turn. Yeah, no, you killed me with that in uh, <laughs> in 2016 in the Masters here in Arizona. <laughs> If you have like a creative imagination, you can really just wreck some stuff up with that. Oh yeah, I think you made me like wasteland my own stuff, and then I bolted my own Delver, and like <laughs> it was, like it was horrible, man. <laughs> but uh, that's not like depending on the deck like you're playing against, he sometimes doesn't do enough. And uh, Kozilek, the Great Distortion, like it would be amazing sometimes if you happen to like show and tell him in against combo. But I kind of don't like like 
the rarity of that happening versus just Butcher of Truth being like a threat to the board, like all the other creatures in the deck. Yeah, and then is reloading your hand, is is that an important part of that card too? Or is it more about the Annihilator and Shuffle? Oh, definitely reloading your hand too. Okay. Whereas like, if they do manage to answer like your Emrakul or even your Ulamog, uh, usually like you're left with nothing after that. If you cast a Kozilek and they answer it, usually he sets you up pretty well for like anything else later. Cool. Okay. I, I do have a question for Tony. Actually. Oh yeah. Okay. Now we got a question here from Mister Ape. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and I'm asking for a friend. It's not me. Um, but can you tell us what are the top three things that you don't want us to name with Pivoting Needle against you? The top three things you don't want to name? No, that no, that you don't want us naming. Like, what are the three uh, best things that I can name with my Pivoting Needles against your deck? Asking for a friend. Asking Mr. for a friend. Yeah, Mr. I run main deck Pithy yeah, Needles know, in my main know. deck turbo depths that I play. <laughs> uh, for me... Just so, ask him, how do I beat you? How do I beat you, Tony? <laughs> uh, so, knowing it's you, don't name Caracas, because Caracas. that's my like win against Merit Lage. But, oh uh, uh, yeah, always against the deck early game. For me, like, say, Expedition Map, because that's just such an early like part of the functioning of the deck. That's a good one. And if he goes late game, always name Ayabugan. Because Ayabugan is like the most important like late game card of the deck. Like what you go for later. Yeah, it's such a sleeper. Like I, I, I played against it at uh, the GP this weekend and I, I lost. Um, and I to- like I dropped needles and I totally forgot I. And we talked about it before. Like <laughs> I totally forgot I and I crushed me. It's just a, it's an in- there's so many engines in your goddamn deck. Yeah, <laughs> definitely so, name Ayabugan if the game's like gone on a few turns. So I yeah. expedition map and then conditionally Caracas if it affects you. What about yeah. Thespian stage? Is that he doesn't run it? Oh, you don't run in that build? I don't usually run Thespian stage. Oh, no. and just Vesuva and you can't you can't needle that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's you can. see. It's well, just not gonna. Oh yeah, you should techni- gonna- <laughs> yeah, technically <laughs> yeah yeah anything. yeah. Excuse <laughs> excuse me. Uh, yeah, and by the way, if you have any corrections as well. Feel free to send them at Arizona uh, Arizona Eternal Magic at gmail.com. That's the email address. We'll take your corrections as well because I'm saying all kinds of stuff and I'm I'm horrible and never really know what exactly I'm talking about. Next question here. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give another one here to Tommy because he's another 12 post player here. And Tommy Kaufman wants to know why have you not converted to the colorless version yet? And we kind of talked about it a little bit, but tell Tommy. Let me ask you, Tommy, a question of my own. <laughs> Why have you not added a color to your deck? Oh! <laughs> no, uh, I think the colorless version is a really a completely different deck than uh, when you add a color to it. I think the colorless version is more dependent on... Uh, it has ancient tombs. It wants to rush out disruption, followed by a quick threat. Yeah. And, like, uh, the color 12 post versions are just fundamentally different. They want the games to go longer. They're more controlling and want to get you more to like a win condition that's more like inescapable for the opponent. Gotcha. Kind of like a more combo deck than aggro deck, maybe you would say. Exactly. Okay, because you get the mid to late game combo pieces in there where you know you're putting big stuff like show and tell that's just insurmountable, like you said. Yeah, and the okay. two colors that I play always blue and green. They, in my opinion, they give the deck so many more options. Like brainstorm will always uh, smoothen your draws in the yeah. deck. Crop rotation, it gets uh, it's a demonic tutor for. Oh, anyway. it's great. Yeah, especially when you're in a, a lands deck. That's a lot of the power comes from the lands. It's huge. That's that's huge, especially when you're weak to wasteland. Okay, crop rotate. You know. Yeah. Defense and offense. Yeah. So, so yeah, cards, like, Tommy, it sounds like you maybe need to add blue and green at <laughs> least to your deck. Tony makes a convincing argument, so maybe you can write in and tell us why you actually play the colorless version instead. Right. He's already got the no candelabras, colors. so his de- I mean, Big Daddy Kaufman just has to spend a little bit more on the show and tell oh, yeah. and stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he probably already has all that stuff. I'm anyways. sure he does. Yeah, but, yeah, okay, so yeah, t- Tommy, there you go. You should add a color. If not, tell us why you don't add a color. Um... Now, you've been playing this deck since how long now? Like, at least since 2013. When did you start playing the deck? No, this was like late 2012 or so. So I guess it's been like almost six years now. Okay. So it's been almost six years. And uh, William Laguna wants to know, do you ever feel like playing a new deck? Uh, Yeah. Well, I mean, my secondary deck is usually Reanimator these days. Oh, yeah? It's kind of a palette cleanser from uh, 12 posts because it's just a completely different type of deck, especially the black red one now. You just go all out combo. Just if they have hate, 
you lose. If they don't, you win. I, rem- so. I remember we played, uh, it was almost a win and in for a top eight at a city champs. And I see my opening hand. I'm like, this isn't going to be 12 posts at all. I mold it. I'm like, all right, this, this six is going to be 12 posts entirely i got you this game and you go chancellor i'm like the fuck the hell is going <laughs> yeah, dude. it's the dude so our, our meta is super inbred here everyone usually knows what other people are playing and it's nice to just be able to just throw other players off here in arizona with something else yeah. not right. only does tony have the baller 12 post deck but he's got the baller japanese reanimator deck too dude tony's a baller man <laughs> so it was weird in japan he brought the unpimped version of the deck it was really weird watching oh, him play white okay. border duels that's safer <laughs> and i respect that i respect that you do lose baller points though right he does yeah. Yeah. and yeah. i think yes i think these two guys i think david and tony have the most pimped out Legacy decks in the valley, right? Because you got the you got the alpha alpha duels, yes. And Tony <laughs> t- Tony just has all the foil, all the beta, all the guru. I think you have like what four or five gurus now. Four, yeah, yeah. These Damn. these are the guys that you want to steal their backpacks after. The tournament, <laughs> so. Yeah, keep an eye out for them at tournaments if if you're a thief. Um, <laughs> pro tip right there, dude. They'll Heard be back in heat. Yeah, you, you'll be back in heat. Yeah, We're in Arizona. So oh yeah, no, out. it's legal. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's see. Another question here is, uh, okay, so let's talk about... Jesse wants to know, how are you always in a good mood? Uh, magic's like just my hobby. It's my escape from just things of normal life. So I always just find like pretty much just enjoyment in it. I've never seen you get salty. Oh, no. I get salty. I just bury it inside. <laughs> just stuff no. it down. Yeah. yeah, get down there with the shame. So in, in childhood in, memories, get down there. Yeah, put it, it down there. Yeah, push it down. So in Japan, Tony's like, he walks up to me all smiling. He's like, I just played a very uh, uh, unpleasant t- t- opponent. I was not happy <laughs> about it, but he's like still totally cool about it. Yeah, this room's split pretty 50-50 on salt right now. Like, <laughs> like we got Tony and David here, probably the chillest players. Nicest players. And then there's you and I, SB. Hey, hey we've been seeing a therapist. Yeah, we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're getting going it to, checked we're going out. To yeah. Magic, anger, anger management. Yeah, you're on your meds, right? Right, yeah, yeah I'm on yeah. the meds. On uh, the deep breathing, deep breathing. Especially yeah. you, Zach. Like, you're usually angry even when you're <laughs> Yeah, dude. I'm, I'm Called just, out, dude, bro. I just, I just wake up on the... Uh, dude, there's no right side of the bed for me. You know what I mean? Every day, wrong side. Got to fix it, though, you know? Try the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe the middle is a little bit better. Yeah, I think the, the first time I met Tony, uh, I think I um, I was new to Legacy. I missed my tabernacle trigger. Lost because of that. And then uh, I think I said some uh, some unpleasant things about playing a tabernacle and how cheap it was and like just some just some salt stuff, you know, and and Tony was just like, you know, I'm very sorry. Um, I'm very <laughs> sorry that you lost that. I think you played it really well. This is after I said rude stuff. Right. He's like. And but I did my best. I I announced that I was playing a tabernacle, and I didn't even have to do that. <laughs> yeah, bitch. Remember your triggers, yeah. Zach. Ever since then, dude, I put like nineteen dice on top of my deck. Right. <laughs> I never missed one since. You, you dude. put the land under the creature. Oh yeah, but the, I do that too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's you, you oh, know. You, man. You, and then I remember when you got look, lo- your your winter orb screwed you against oh, him. <laughs> yeah, dude. That oh, was so many great moments. That was part of it too. Winter orb with then he goes tabernacle, and I'm like. Like, oh, this is this know. is bad. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's that's all the questions we have, and then we uh, for Tony. So we're gonna move on here and talk a little bit about a question from uh, Kevin, and I'm gonna find it here eventually. Um, so Kevin has a question, uh, and he phrases it quote. So I have a question for the cast. How do you evaluate your home brews? Like, how do you know? When to just drop something and move on, or when a deck list is just not quite tuned enough. And I'm assuming he means keep working on it there. So how, how do you know when to drop one of your homebrew decks because it's bad? And how do you know, and, and where do you gauge that? And do you continue it? And how do you know that? Anybody make homebrews here? I just net deck. Um, so I, I, I net... I net deck tier two decks usually, right? Like okay. I don't like to play the best decks, 
But in the past year, I've been spending a lot more time with Anthony Hare, who is like a notorious brewer that oh, yeah, plays he is. really janky, weird, weird decks. You can check out his Lumberjack deck yeah, uh, on MTG Top 8 for one of the Arizona events. So, like, at low stakes events, I'm more willing to play crappy decks. So, okay. like, a while ago, I played, like, the Hypergenesis Show and Tell deck. That and it sounds was, fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and then... And that was more homebrewy, right? It was homebrew... Yeah, it was definitely, like, I mean, the, the optimal build is just sneak and, sneak and show. Okay. So, I played, like, the Hypergenesis Show and Tell deck, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and then just in general, like, I think a lot of us, like you said earlier, our meta is pretty, like, not necessarily inbred, but like it's known. So yeah, it's known. we yeah, know what we word. need to pack. Um, but then also there's sometimes like I'm stubborn. So like, if it's not signed, I don't want to play it. Yeah. That's a gross habit. Right. Like, you Which gotta, is, you so like, gotta get rid of that one. The Assassin's Trophy is not signed in my deck, but like I got the four signed Dark Confidants, but I, I think it's just like, you want to play what you like. Okay. Um, but I do net deck a lot. Like I've been playing Miracles. I might pr- try Grixis Delver at the at the Toys for Tots tournament that we have coming up on Saturday that I know Zach will talk about. Um, yeah, we're gonna do shout outs and promos here towards yeah. the end. So keep around if you're. But I think low stakes tournaments is where I'll brew F and M's. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Now, David, I know that you have had some home brews in the past. Like you were you were on the you were a pioneer in the Doomsday era. And then you also have uh, done some like blue black standstill and control and just like some some weird stuff. So tell me about that stuff and why why don't you play it anymore? Well, actually, um, this last Tuesday I went to Connected Gaming and uh, on a Tuesday we had sixteen players come out. That's sweet, dude. That Balling. was really cool. And I actually brought a brew of bug still. Ooh, so you haven't given up. All no, right. no. I got to bring out the spice every once in a while. All right. So what does your list look like for bug still? Uh, I tried uh, four standstills pretty much in a bug control shell. Uh, it was only Bayful Strix as my creature with two Mishra's factories and a creeping tarpit. Okay. okay. And then the traditional three Jaces, one Lily, one in the board. Okay. Um, and which, uh, Lily last hope. Yes. Okay. Yes. The good one now. Yes. Oh, um, my sweet tech with it was I had an abyss in the sideboard <laughs> and the abyss doesn't kill your own Bayful Strix. So it definitely locked down. Oh, Cause creatures. it's non artifact. It's not. Oh, artifact. damn. So yes. I had a lot That's of fun good. there. That's good. Uh, wild. So how'd you, how'd you do that? Uh, I actually went two one. That's not bad, right? They only did three rounds. At, on yeah, 16? just three rounds. I guess it's a Tuesday. It's a, it's Tuesday. a Tuesday. Okay, it's okay. nice to get in, play a couple rounds, and then still be able to go home. Yeah, and work on Wednesday. Yeah, most people have jobs. Exactly. Most of us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I look for in a homebrew, I want to be able to answer pretty much everything that I'm going to see. So if my homebrew is just kind of a glass cannon, I kind of enjoy playing that here and there. Okay. But... If I just fold to a counter spell or two, uh, I try to figure out a way to make that glass cannon work. Uh, okay. For example, I played Spanish Inquisition a couple years ago. <laughs> cool. That was really fun. And um, my answer to counter spells was Elvish Spirit Guide into um, Autumn's Veil, which. Uh, what? All okay, what is Autumn's Veil? It's a one green instant, which all your spells can't be the target of a blue or black spell. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so it, sweet. It was your sweet. green force of will. Yeah. Pitch a Simeon Spirit Guide, green, and you can't counter my stuff anymore. That's great. That's savage. <laughs> yeah. It definitely was fun, but and I took that to uh, GP New Jersey. Many years ago, I can't remember what year it was. Four years ago. Yeah, and uh, that was when Treasure Cruise was legal, and I should have been brewing with Treasure Cruise instead, Yeah, but I was on the no blue plan, and I went um, first nine rounds of the GP, eight rounds where you are Delver, and then... Sad. (laughs) Very, very. And then the last round, I was like, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to try to have fun, hopefully verse a different deck. (laughs) Pox. <laughs> That's awful. Dude. All right, and then so you were an avid Doomsday player for years, and that was, and you did a lot of like home brewing with Doomsday for sure. So, and then you went. How did you know when to stop playing Doomsday? I don't think we've talked about that on the podcast. Honestly, I put a lot of uh, effort on Moto Online. Uh, I kept getting. Uh, I had an over fifty percent win rate with 
my homebrew of Doomsday. I had a couple of players, uh, James Johns and Albert, uh, help me out with it. But once uh, Git Probe was banned, the deck wasn't functioning correctly, and I was losing matchups that were relatively buys. So I kind of decided, all right, I guess that's time to pitch my homebrew, and I'm going to go ahead and switch over to Ant. Yeah. It's... Once, and you've just killed it since you started playing it. True, true. Except in my Japan showing, but you know. Yeah, but most happens. of the time, most of the time. Here and there. Uh, it's Once the homebrew, like, if you can't answer certain things that are really in the meta, that's when I feel like, all right, maybe we got to go ahead and rethink the deck choice. Yeah. Because, like, Spanish Inquisition, your only way to answer those counter spells was your four of Autumn's Veil. Well, and four of <laughs> Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Four of that, four of Simeon Spirit <laughs> wow. Guy, dude. There's so much yeah. blue. You had to. Oh, yeah. And we had Xantas Worm in there as well. And if you could run more of them, you probably sh- could have. Oh, or you I'd probably would have run yeah. like a full 16. Yeah. <laughs> I think David's also, him and Stefan, they're the kind of players that like to kill you in a really weird way. Exactly. They're weirdos. Yeah. They don't want to kill you. They just want to <laughs> win the game with like Ladman or Sheldock Isle Emrakul. But like, I think they enjoy confusing their opponent more than winning. Yeah, definitely. At least Stefan seems like he does. Oh yeah, Stefan's all just about like the- he's like draw four cards, lose half my life. Draw four cards, lose half my life. I made seventeen hundred goblins go. Yeah. Like I don't know how he does it. So yeah. the weird plays in I'll Japan. Have to get him in here because I don't think anyone plays a deck like him. The weird play in Japan that like we kept talking about all weekend was he'd be like Taiga. Mox, uh, a chrome mox imprint, d- d- uh, death shadow, and his opponents <laughs> are like, What the hell is going on here? Yes, dude, <laughs> yes, that's Stefan, dude. He, right. oh man, it's gonna be a labyrinth picking his brain, dude. It's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna, yeah, we'll have to get him in here. And then, of course, Tony, I mean, you're pioneering, you know, homebrewing the 12 posts. There's not a lot of other people out there, uh, that are doing this. So, uh, why have you stuck with 12 posts despite uh, other people kind of giving up on their homebrews? Uh, like I said, I just think like the fundamentals of the deck winning through its lands. I think it's just a good enough strategy to still pursue, even like despite losing top and some of those weaknesses. Uh, so yeah, uh, whenever I pretty much always with my twelve post brews, always stick to like a basic like skeleton of the deck, like the things I know that works, and then I'll like try some modifications to try and answer a particular problem. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, the abrupted case came in when I needed answers for like these particular permanents that were causing me trouble. Okay. Or uh, when I'm looking for better answers against combo, now I'm like looking at more proactive solutions like revokers and sphere of resistances instead of like reactive, like yeah. force of will or fluster or something like that. Okay. Yeah, I'll try out these modifications mostly on Modo, and then I can usually feel if they're like going to be effective or not, or if they're yeah. just too narrow. Okay. And then what kind of what kind of stuff have you given up in on in the twelve post universe? Like is there some strategies that you tried that you just that are interesting that that just don't work but you wish they did? Oh yeah, plenty of them. Like I was trying like a brew before without uh show and tells and primeval titans. Because mm-hmm. there is like a good mono green deck going around now that's like mostly focused on ramp with like candelabras. That sounds fun. Yeah, it's definitely like super consistent. I just feel like weaker against like particular matchups that I could be winning with show and tell. Yeah. But yeah, I was trying like a blue green version of that with like brainstorms and ponders to try and like smoothen out those draws. But yeah, I think it just lacked like the consistency of the mono green and also like the power of like the show and tell and like the typical blue green. Yeah. Yeah. And it gives you access to, you know, defensive spells or I'm sorry, reactive spells with force of wills and stuff on the side right yeah yeah okay i noticed you cut ugin the spirit dragon recently like he seems like a house was he just not cutting it for you yeah he's like sometimes not necessary in the decks that don't have like aren't particularly built around their ramp like my bug build now it's like less about like ramping with cloud posts than like say the mono green build now i didn't know you stopped you took ugin out man i'm gonna have to play more elves now because you've wiped my (laughs) board with ugin over and over (laughs) <laughs> As I've played elves over the years, you've been like my boss on that deck. <laughs> like, I'll get past the first stage, but I always lose. The Ugin is gone. <laughs> yeah, and I might have a chance now, dude. We're going to have to brawl, dude. I mean, I, we're right. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a house. Like, if you can afford to play him and, like, get him down, resolve him. Yeah, it makes sense. 
uh, like us 12 post players, we're always looking for like a replacement for top. I know like some people have been testing out scroll rack. What about Miri's Guile? Miri's Guile could possibly be like. Yeah, it might be worth a try. Oh, Maybe like, ooh, I think you put Tony ooh, on this. I actually had a good thought for once, dude. Ooh. Tony's like, yeah, God damn. He's like, holy yeah. shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was brewing a Bant Miracles with Miri's Guile. It was horrible, dude. I was doing that with... Um, so I had a, a home brew. I've had a couple of them. They've never come to fruition because they just are so bad and I'm bad at brewing. I had uh, one that was running um, Nissa, the Steward of Elements, I believe is what it's called. Uh, so she is like an ex blue green planeswalker her plus ability is like scry two right then her she has like i can't remember what her minus middle ability is but then her ultimate turns like x amount of lands depending on how many counters you spend into five five flyers right so it was it was trying to like play her ramp her up make some flyers and for like a win con right and then we'll also like filtering through your deck. Plus then you'd have Miri's Guile, Brainstorms, Ponders and everything like that for filter in place of, this is after the top banning. Um, yeah, but it was the bad. consistency was just, it was horrible. Yeah. It was horrible. Um, those colors didn't give you access to enough hate spells. Like, like Jess Guy Miracles was just hands down better. And then Blue White Miracles was just more efficient. And so I immediately, once like the top banning happened there, I realized my bant was compared just hot garbage. Uh, I switched over to that Portent and Predict list, the blue white Portent and Predict list that that first came out. I can't remember who was who was I. I first saw. I think it was like White Faces on Moto. Have you guys seen that name? Before? I think it was. Does that sound familiar Sounds to you? Sounds questionable. White Faces. <laughs> I think I'm pretty sure that's like some. It's like something like that. And I'm so sorry if I'm butchering that name. Uh, you can send it into the corrections. But yeah, I saw that. And that's when I knew I had to give up on my homebrew there. Then I was trying to brew another one. And this one's even worse, guys. So my other homebrew was a chalice deck, blue-green chalice deck that didn't run brainstorms and didn't run crop rotations. And instead, it was like running moxes and like ancient tombs. And uh, it was running... Sylvan scrying for like grabbing the land stuff, and then it was running Azura and Trinisphere, and it was just like a blue green lockdown. I couldn't make that work, but it like it sounded fun to like make a blue green like prison deck, but it was it was it was just horrible, dude. It was the worst for card filtering. Like, talk was so great because yeah. compared to that, like these are the enchantment ones like Miri's Guile and Sylvan scrying, they don't take effect until like the following turn. Plus, they're, like, pretty bad in multiples, so you can't just, like, overload on them like you do with tops. Yeah. Which is one weakness of them. Yeah, because you can, with top and flipping and brains, you can get rid of them pretty easily. And, yeah, so I guess, you know, maybe they're, it's not as good there. But I think that's going to wrap it up here for the O2 Dropcast episode number three. Again, with us today, we had Mr. Daniel Espinoza. Yeah. We had Mr. David Chikowski. Woot woot. And Mr. Tony Murata, best player in the room. Toys for Tops. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. We're going to do promotions here. Uh, yeah, I just want to give a shout out to... So we know we're international now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We have a fan uh, in Japan, Ryosuke Kanamori. He also knows of me. He's a fellow 12 post player. Nice. So uh, thank you, Ryosuke. And uh, anybody else listening from around the world? Yeah. Yeah. What up? What up to the internationals, man? We in the, yeah. We have so, it translated in 50 languages by the end of next month. Yep. Yeah, and, and we're going to crowdsource that one. So if you're listening to this and you know it, right. yeah, definitely put some captions on for us on the YouTube. That would be, that would be great. Uh, but no, seriously. Uh, so, uh, and I'm, again, I'm Zach Zent. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, well, first, let's, do, do you want to shout out anybody, Tony? Do you want to, you got a Twitch channel, don't you? Uh, yeah, so this is just getting public for the first time now, but it's probably going to be about a month. Breaking news. <laughs> but uh, I'm definitely going to try and start streaming, basically a stream all about 12 posts on Modo, because I know a lot of people probably want to see how like I'm doing well with this deck. And yeah. I feel like other streamers don't really do the deck justice. Okay. So. All right. That's a bold statement, dude. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, dude. Bringing down the hammer. Yeah. So I'd like to share the 12 post love with the world. Perfect, yeah. dude. I think you have a really interesting deck, and I think you're really talented at playing it. So I'm sure a lot of people would appreciate it. What's the uh, username we're going to look out oh, for? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. What? Yeah, tell us what it is. It'll be in the show notes too, by the way. 
I'm currently into play with a underscore between the two words. The streaming's probably not going to start for like another month or so, but I've definitely been brainstorming about it. No pun intended. Oh. <laughs> hey, this isn't the brainstorm podcast. No. No. <laughs> no. But uh, yeah, expect to see some more 12 post content out there for me. Cool. I'm excited, man. We have a, I want to give a shout out to Frankie. He, um, he's the, the true nightmare uh, with no E on true on Twitch. Um, you can find it on uh, ArizonaEternalMagic.com where uh, he's part of the team here. He streams a lot of random stuff. So if you're a fan of Legacy, check out his channel as well. And then, of course, if you want to get into this awesome 12 post stuff, check out Tony Murata's stream. And what was it one more time? Uh, into play. Okay. And that'll be on the on the show notes. And then, guys, you want to shout out anybody in the community yeah, here? Put someone on blast. I got a couple shout outs. And I, I, I do want to say, I think it's True Nightmare and Nightmares with a K. Nightmares with for, a K. Okay. Uh, for Frankie. Yeah. And he has, like, I've watched him stream, like, he has a, an ungodly amount of cards. Like his his yes, his cool. online collection like rivals people's paper collections. It well, I think it his paper collection is really yeah, good. Yeah, it's too. insane. He can play he, a lot of decks. He has like any deck that he could ever want to play online. Yeah, um, I want to be Frankie. I, I would like to steal his account someday. Yeah. But he's also like we'll just beat it up and take yeah, all right. of his stuff. Yeah, he's you're gonna edit this part out so Frankie doesn't hear it though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, this, perfect, yeah, this is perfect, yeah, perfect. absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll get, um, we'll get Frankie. My <laughs> shout out. So one, I want to shout out Zach for uh, you know lending us your home and all your equipment so we can do this. Um, but my, my big shout out is to my international boys, uh, David Zikowski, Stefan Yushkovich, Stefan uh, Tony Murata and big daddy, Mike Hadley. Yeah. Um, I had a blast. Um, as a noob to traveling, I would have been so lost, but David and Stefan were like the chief navigators. They, they like just like knew exactly what train stations we need to get on. So, they made the trip so much less stressful for me and hooking up them flights. But uh, yeah, I want to scoop in. Uh, not scoop in. We're not that. We're not the Levy and Legacy podcast. No, we're not that cool. Dude. Uh, they got a great podcast, to, though, dude. Right? Oh yeah. Uh, so yeah, out check out Leaving a Legacy boys. if you if you have heard this and not Leaving a Legacy. There's something wrong with you. Yeah, there is something wrong with you. Check them out. But yeah, shout out to the uh, the international crew. Uh, it was a blast, guys. You, uh, what are your shout outs, David? I don't know. <laughs> David's selfish. He doesn't care about anyone. It's just David. No, no. I mean Yeah, well, okay. So uh trip. let's let's do a little bit of news here. So we're gonna we have a lot of stuff going on in Arizona here coming up in the next couple months. So on December eighth, which is this Saturday, um at Phoenix Gaming Lounge, we're doing another charity event based on the success of our last charity event. It's close to the holidays. Um, so I, I think we're going to get a little bit of less attendance. So if you're in Arizona or within driving distance, our last one was a one K. I hope we can get enough players to make this big as well. We donated, uh, $1,800 with our last charity event and this one, the details signups are at 11 on December 8th starts at noon. It's going to be a $20 entry or you can do $10 with a toy. Um, we're going to do probably, you know, the typical five rounds cut to top eight, that kind of stuff. Uh, prizing will be based on attendance and no promises here, but I'm trying to set up another raffle. Ooh. I might be able to finagle something. I got a couple irons in the fire. Again, no promises. Hopefully there will be. Uh, check out our Facebook page, Arizona Eternal Magic, or I think it's actually just AZ Eternal Magic. Uh, I need to change that. Um, so yeah, check out the Facebook page or the website for, for details on that. And you can always see the updates in the uh, AZ Magic Players Legacy Facebook group. And uh, yeah, I, th I think that's... Oh, and then the pod event. We got the pod event in January, on January 12th. And same idea, it's going to be uh, signups at 11, starts at 12. Pod is player draw out in Avondale. And that is going to be the first Legacy City Champs series for the year of 2019. Ooh, so I'm so come, excited. Pressure's on. Yeah, come out, break some ice, dude, for 2019. Um, I'm pro Historically, I've done very poor at pod. Uh, I, I, like, <laughs> New Year's resolution. I, it's always big. It's always big, and there's too many good players, so I never do well. Uh, but that should be a really cool event there, too. And uh, we're going to be you know, prizing that out, and uh, again, based off of attendance there. So that should be a good tournament. Uh, Hopefully everyone can show up here in the Valley for, for the pod one because that's going to be after the holidays. Hopefully everyone's back in town and everything like that. So again, uh, with us today, 
We had Mr. Daniel Espinoza, Mr. David Sikowski, Tony Murata, and I'm Zach Zent. And thank you for listening to the O2 Dropcast. Let's get my camera action. Let's get my camera action.